Money everyone. Money everyone. Money everyone. Money everyone. Right, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to today's uh, masterclass. I'm glad to see that we have quite right, some number of people who have joined. Um, thank you for joining Modupe, Oluwa Tosin, Ade Tutu, Sarah. Also thank you for joining Dr. Baba Gide. We'll just give about um, five minutes for others to join in and then we'll kick off. So just give five minutes uh, before, we, before we start. Thank you. In the meantime, please, could you drop in the chat box where you are joining us from, um, whether Lagos, um, Kaduna, Kano, wherever you are joining us, just put it in the chat box that I'm joining from Lagos, I'm joining from Benin, wherever you're joining from. We'd love to know in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, Modupe is joining. Um, Sarah is joining from Abel Buta, right? Thank you. Modupe is joining from Lagos, right? Thank you very much. Um, Rose is coming in. 
All right. So just five minutes for others to join in and we, we start up the session. Welcome once again, if you're just joining us, uh, this is Sprint 5 Masterclass, and um, we're excited that you're here joining us today. Um, I can also see Ulu Atosin who has joined us. Welcome. Um, we'll be starting in, yes, we only give five minutes, and so we would start now. Yes. So good morning once again, everyone, and welcome to this masterclass. And today's masterclass is particularly unique. And that's because um, we have special people um, who will be taking us on today's masterclass. Um, this is the ninth masterclass that 25 um, has been holding. And we're excited that you are in this journey with us also to partake of this masterclass. And I'll just go briefly um, so the instructors we're having today and just a short introduction of what Sprintify is, and then we kick off um, from there. Okay, so very short um, introduction for Macaulay Babaji. Dr. Macaulay is a native of Lagos State, Nigeria, an academic and educational consultant. Before I continue, can everyone hear me? I don't assume that you can hear me. Please, if you can hear me, just type in the chat box that you can hear me. Or if I'm not clear, just type in the chat box that I'm not clear. If you can hear me, please type in the chat box that you can hear me. If you can hear me, please type in the chat box that you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so I think I'm audible, so I, I can just go on. Okay, so let me just go on. So I said, Dr. Macaulay is a native of Lagos State. Nigeria, an academic and educational consultant, is a 150 fellow of the Royal Commonwealth Society, non-resident fellow of the Nigerian Global Affairs Council, and a 2021 Caritin Youth Fellow at Sci-Fi. He holds a bachelor's degree with first class 
in Biology from the Federal University of Technology Accre in 2010, then went on to win the highly prestigious Commonwealth Scholarship twice to fund his master's degree in Sustainable Environmental Management from the Natural Resources Institute, University of Greenwich, UK, and a PhD degree in Environmental Geochemistry and Geomicrobiology from the University of Manchester, UK. Currently lectures in the Department of Biology, that's Environmental Biology and Public Health Unit at FUTA. In 2018, Dr. Macaulay founded Illumania, an online educational consulting outfit where he leads a team of 37 consultants and administrators to provide academic support to students and graduates and business professionals at affordable rates. And Illumina has become um, a very, uh, has expanded. And you know, it, I still saw a testimony from one yesterday on Facebook, how he won his scholarship just with the support of Illumina. So Illumina has gone ahead to um, provide that opportunity for people to get scholarships, you know, to develop their, it's an online educational consulting firm that has expanded throughout the years. And we're excited to have Dr. Baba Jide in here with us. Um, the next um, speaker that we'll be having is Buluwati Fair Ainde. Buluwati Fair Ainde is a content developer, brand strategist, and human resource professional with over three years experience. Um, with a background in communications and human resources, she has worked with several brands and people from diverse backgrounds, locally and internationally. Currently works as a human resource generalist at Jobberman, Nigeria. She holds a bachelor's degree in mass communication, Bowen University, and white schooling. She interned and completed her NYC at Media Houses, after which she furthered her career in the same path. And so she plans to grow further in human resources and use her skills and knowledge and network, as well as understanding of HR, to ensure youth and fresh graduates are groomed and owned so they are properly placed to have such learning in the workforce. And for now, we have Dr. Babajili on the call, and I would just like him to just, um, just welcome everyone. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, all right. So thank you so much for having me, and I'm really excited to be here. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Babajide. OK, so just moving on, on um, just a short introduction of what Sprintify is and um, why we are having um, this masterclass today. So Sprintify is a digital um, organ training organization, and our focus is to develop the 21st century skills um, for people, uh, for beginners and mid-level professionals in Nigeria. And our goal is to expand um, digital skills in Nigeria and help um, people to start or grow their career and support their skills as well. Um, currently, Sprintify is focused on empowering the future digital leaders. And so we look at areas where people need to develop in their own skills and advance you know, their career. And one of the offerings that Spotify is currently on is called the Product School. The Product School is a um, training school where people are taught on product management. And if you've heard of product management before, product management is a green field in Nigeria. And we want to support people with um, the skills on product management. And so they are able to start and, you know, and um, start and grow their career in product management. And what does the school offer? Um, the school is a five-week school where you are taught from start to finish on how to develop a product. Um, we have instructors from InterSwitch, from Google, from Schneider Electric, who are seasoned product managers and walk through, through the process of, you know, the theory of what product is and the practicality of how to you know, have a product and to run a product. And one of the things that we have in the school is that we are able to support your career growth in product management. That is at the end of your um, five-week training, we pair you up with product mentors. We call them product mentors who support your skills and your knowledge in establishing that product, um, product that you have. And then for, for the advanced classes, we get to pitch to mentors 
um, of your own idea, your product that you've created, and you get funding for it. And aside that, also we pair you up with to also create job opportunities for you, for you to utilize the skills that you have um, gained. So I'll be dropping the links in the chat for you to learn more about the product school and get emails for me later on about the product school. So without wasting much of our time, um, I'll move on to welcome our first um, speaker for today's masterclass, and that is Dr. Baba Jidani. He'll be taking us on how to write a killer CV that commands attention. Now, we believe that this is very important for each and every one of us, and so we would like you to pay rapt attention, and, um, and if you have questions, please drop in the chat box, and we'll definitely respond to them. Dr. Baba Jidani, you're on now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for having me again. Um, let me immediately just share my slides and we can go on because of time. Um, okay, so. Just a moment. All right, please let me know if you can see my slide. Yeah, we can see it all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, before I go on, um, let me just say this. When it comes to CV, nothing is cast in stone. So I don't want a situation where Perhaps you meet another mentor of yours, and then what he tells you is different from what I tell you here today, and you feel there is a problem with him or the problem with his advice. No. When it comes to CV, it's so creative, it's fluidy, there is no um, fixed rule around it, although there are basic fundamental rules that you must not break. But upon that, you can be creative. It's, you can change them any way you want. The most important thing is that it reflects your strengths. It must reflect your strengths. That is it. In relation to the job you are applying for, or the role you are applying for, or the scholarship you want to get. Because these days, scholarship sponsors may ask you to also upload your CV. So today, I will be touching on academic and um, corporate CVs as well. So nothing is cast in stone. This is not a situation where I give you rules that you must stick to. It's liable to change. The most important thing here is to be smart to know what exactly to change and rework based on the sector, the country you are in, and expectations of your employer. All right, so let's go on. I hope you can see my next slide. I want to be sure you can see my slides as I move. Can you see the next slide, please? Yes, sir, we can see it, sir. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so for today, I will be touching on resume, CV. Now, this was slotted in yesterday. I just realized that um, it might be important for me to differentiate the two um, and to let you know what's actually going on with the two of them. Uh, so I'll be touching on resume, CV, touching on academic corporate CVs, modern CV templates, what it looks like, what you should not have in them. I'll be touching on common mistakes to avoid. Um, at Illumania, we don't only help people with scholarships, we also review their CVs for them. So I've come across hundreds of CVs, trust me, in the last four or five years. So I know the common mistakes that um, young people make, especially fresh graduates. I will touch on a couple of them. Um, strategies to boost the quality of your CV as well. And lastly, important parts of your CV to LinkedIn for better visibility. Reason being that when you look at your profile on LinkedIn, it's somewhat an electronic CV. <laughs> and I'll prove that to you. It's like an electronic CV. So it's important to 
take your CV and have a replica of it on LinkedIn so that you can be found easily. These days, people get jobs on LinkedIn. Even there are scouts on LinkedIn that will look for you, get you, and make you an offer. If they like um, your skill sets, your experience, and they feel you are what they need, they will come to you. All right. So let's look at resume versus CV. A resume is a concise description of experiences, while a CV is a detailed account of achievements and experiences. So you can see the two active words there for resume. It's concise, concise, short, uh, brief, while a CV is detailed. It has probably everything you want to say about yourself, your experiences, your education, um, your achievements in relation to the role that you're applying for. A resume is usually a single page document. Usually it's a single page document. And again, it's usually meant for fresh graduates who have no experience. They don't have much experience. Maybe the only, like in Nigeria, the only experience you probably have as a, as a fresh graduate is your internship or perhaps NYSE, where you served during your NYSE. So these are the experiences that you probably have. And so it's so short. And I do not expect you should write more than a page, because what exactly would you be writing about? Um, or an entry level employee. So these are the two groups that resumes are often requested from. Now, while a CV has multiple pages, depending on the length of experience and academic achievements that you have. Now, in Europe, a resume and a CV are generally used interchangeably. When I was in the UK, you would never come across anyone ask you for a resume. It's usually CV, 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 CV. And so the CV thing came up a lot when I was in the UK. And um, so whether you're a fresh graduate, they'll tell you to submit a CV, but they will now be specific about the length. You could hear things like a CV, a one page CV, which is technically a resume. So depending on the country you are located in, you will be seeing these variations in nomenclature. The most important thing is to know exactly what they're asking from you. The most important thing is to know exactly what they're asking from you. Now, for example, when they ask you for a one-page CV, that means it's not a document for you to start putting all kinds of unnecessary things. If they ask you for two pages, same, but if they are quiet about the length, that means they are giving you the liberty to express yourself, tell us more about yourself, and put in more things that could help you um, get that job. But please do not put things that are irrelevant just to increase the length. Because for CVs, it's quality over quantity. So don't just put in a CV of nine pages where the only thing that makes sense are probably four, the other five just wasted pages. So be very careful. It's always quality over quantity. Um, so it's in, the, in, in Europe, for example, in UK, CV and resume are used interchangeably, which means that an academic CV or resume is submitted to academia and a corporate CV or resume is submitted to the industry. However, in the US, the two documents are different. A resume is submitted to the industry while CVs are submitted to academia. So you can see that now, CVs, you have to be careful and you have to know, I'm sorry, I just want to see, I saw a message in there. Okay, so Uloma is saying that she can't hear me. I hope others can hear me. Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Okay, so Uloma, that will probably be from your end. So I would say you should, yes, I would say you should um, probably log in again and that might be rectified. All right, so um, in the US, the two documents are different. A resume is submitted to the industry while CVs are submitted to academia. So you can see that now. In Nigeria, a resume is often requested from fresh graduates 
while CVs are requested from those with more than two years work experience, be it in academia or industry. I work in the university, what we are asked to submit are CVs. And I'm aware that uh, most employers in Nigeria too will ask you to submit CVs. So um, we are probably following the UK pattern. Um, you hardly come across an employer asking you to submit a resume. You hardly come across it in Nigeria. But when you do, understand that it's a one page or maximum of two pages document uh, that should just focus on your skill sets. Don't worry, I'll get to the content soon. Generally, resumes begin with work experience while CVs begin with educational qualifications. Now, however, there is, um, this is not strictly followed in many countries, including Nigeria. Now, this rule is not strictly followed. A resume, you could start with your education. There is no problem. You could also follow up with work experience. That's fine. The most important thing here is this. For me, I feel that always think about your strength. So if you know that you do not have excellent grades, you probably want to start with work experience. If you have relevant work experience that you know your employer to be, would want to see. So you probably want to start with something that will help them have a first impression that would last long before they see um, um, your education. Also, you can be silent about your grade. If you know it's not that great, just be silent about it. But if you know you have excellent grades, please um, flash it. Because as I said, it's your strength. Showcase your strength as best as you can, whether it's academic in nature, whether it's work related in nature. Just ensure that your CV, your resume displays your strength and encourages your employer to contact you for an interview. Um, now, the most important thing is to use the document to showcase your strength. I've said that already. Um, so, okay. So the next slide is a tabulation of resume versus um, a CV, which is the, your curriculum vitae. Now, in French, it means summary. Resume means summary. And what does it mean? It means that you have to be brief, you have to be concise, maximum of one to two pages. Now, for CV, on the other hand, it means course of life in Latin. Course of life, that means what you have been through um, that is relevant to your applied role and you feel you need to tell your employer about it, what you have been through in life, what you have been taught in life, you can see that it's going to be longer. It's to cover a lot of things, uh, leadership, voluntary experience, education, achievements. So they just want everything so that they can have a holistic view of who you are. That's CV. And it can be up to two pages and longer. Now, your resume emphasizes the skills. For CV, it emphasizes emphasizes education uh, and accomplishments and many more. For resume, it contains sections such as work experience, including internships, extracurricular activities, voluntary experience, and could include education, just as I said earlier. For CB, on the other hand, it contains sections such as education, work experience, awards and recognitions, skills and competencies, leadership, voluntary experiences, and many more. But this is just key portions that they both contain. Now, resumes and CVs are country specific. I've highlighted that earlier, that in the UK, uh, both are used interchangeably. In the US, they are different. So they are country specific and they are sector specific. For example, in academia in Nigeria, if you want to become a lecturer, the template of um, your CV to submit to a university is totally different from the one that, for example, a bank would ask you to submit. It's totally different from the one that, for example, a hospital will ask you to submit, or let's say KPMG, an auditing firm will, will ask you to submit. So understand that it's sector specific and you must know exactly what is obtainable in each sector before you proceed. 
Therefore, if you are not sure what type of document to submit, do not hesitate to ask from the HR or contact person from the target firm. Nothing is cast in stone, so always ask questions when in doubt. Don't always make assumptions. Now, as stated earlier, in some countries, both CV and resume are used interchangeably. Therefore, it is important to know the difference between an academic CV and a corporate CV. So we are going to go into academic versus corporate soon. Now, the difference between an, an academic CV and, and a corporate CV is not in the length, could even be the same length actually, but in the content. So it's not really in the length, it's in the content. Now, while an academic CV showcases the individual's academic dexterity, a corporate CV highlights the individual's relevant work experience. Generally, the work experience section appears before the education section in corporate CVs and vice versa in academic CVs. So what this means is that your work experience might come before education when you are writing a corporate CV, while for an academic CV, you can have your education before work experience. Now let's look at a typical academic CV and how the sections should, what the sections are and the contents of the sections. First, your full name. Now there's a way it should be written. I will speak more on that later. But for example here, Macaulay Babajide Milton, that's my name. Now you can have it spelled the first way where your first name there is your son name. And it should be denoted. And after that, you should have a comma. Once it has a comma, we know it's your son name automatically. So this is one, one rule of writing your name. The other is to write it by saying Babajide Milton Macaulay, which means that your first name first, and then your middle name next, and your son name last. Once you write it this way without a comma, we assume that the last name there is your son name. If the first name is your son name, you must put a comma after it so that we are sure that it's your son name. Don't make us start guessing which is your son name, which one is, which one is your first name. Please make it easy for us because there are rules to writing names in the corporate world or in the professional space. Now, the next thing is your contact details. And that implies your address, your email, and your mobile number. If you have more than one email address, please put them there. If you have more than one mobile number, please put them there. Now, for an academic CV, you are going to need research interest. It will replace summary. You probably don't need summary when it comes to an academic CV. What you need is research interest or interest if you have more than one, and you have to rank them so that the professor or the academic institution reading um, your CV would know exactly um, the research interest that you are thinking about and how that fits their plan or his plan if you are writing an individual. For example, a professor in the US, maybe you sent him a cold email and you attached an, an academic CV, you need to put your research interest so that he knows exactly um, where you are heading to and how that ties up with his own plans in his lab. Education is the next section. Okay, education is the next section. And um, this, for education section, I would suggest that you should not only talk about the university you graduated from, um, the course you studied, I advise that you should also add the title of your dissertation or thesis, add it there. Why? So that it becomes so easy for the professor or the academic institution to know exactly the kind of research skills that you would have acquired as a result of the project that you executed. They would know exactly, instantly, without trying to guess or without trying to go through your publications before they can start trying to figure out what you did as your project just right there after putting the course, um, sorry, the school you attended, the course you studied, the grade you had, just put in um, um, the title of your dissertation. Don't forget, this is an academic CV. 
put the title of your dissertation. Now, if your supervisor is someone who is, should I say, very popular or influential in that space, in that research space, please slot in his name. It's very important so that they would know that you were trained by one of the best. Slot in his name, say supervisor, Kong Kong Colon, put his name there, flash it. It's an advantage to you because you were taught by one of the best. Now, work experience, add responsibilities and achievements. Many people don't do this. They will just put in their work experience. It's one of the common mistakes I've seen. I will address this when we get to common mistakes to avoid. Awards, honors, recognitions. Um, please add further details because some people make a very big mistake here. They just put something like uh, best students, Federal University of Technology, Akure. That doesn't make any sense to someone who is abroad reading through. He needs to know best student, how? How was it done? So you probably need to put extra information saying that awarded as the overall best for graduating with the highest CGPA in my cohort, in bracket, 100 students, close the bracket, from the Department of Biology, Federal University of Technology, Ondo State, Nigeria. That will make him understand that the basis of selection was the CGPA. You had the highest CGPA in your class, so that they know what best implies. Best is a relative term. We don't know what it means. So, Always put additional information to your awards, to your honors, to your recognitions, so that whoever is reading understands clearly how you got it and why you got it. Professional affiliations. You need to also state this. If you're a member of NIM, uh, the Nigerian Institute of Management, NSE, Nigerian Society of Engineers, CIE, um, Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, this is a UK one anyway. I am a member of that. NAPE, which I think is uh, the Nigerian uh, Association of Petroleum Explo Explorationists in Nigeria, those geosciences people, that's their group. Now, if you're a member of any of these, please state it. State it, it's important because that will make them know that you belong to a professional organization. And yes, there's, there's some credibility with you. You are being mentored, monitored, and managed by a professional group. So that is good. Skills and competencies is next. And this will include how you obtain the skills. So it's not nice to just say uh, digital skills, um, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, blah, blah, blah. You need to tell us how you acquired it. It's important. So this is one way to boost the quality of your CV. Tell us how you acquired it so that we won't feel like you're just writing stuff because anyone can write stuff, anything. But tell us, tell us how you acquired it. It will help us trust the content of your document. Publications, published, that's papers that you published, papers that you've submitted, please put them there and also say that you submitted it, it's also journal. Put the manuscript number because if you've submitted it, it will have a manuscript number. Put the manuscript number as evidence and also add manuscripts being prepared. So these are projects that have been completed, but you're working on the manuscripts. Also put a small head in saying manuscripts being prepared and put them there. Also, you can tell us journals you are thinking of publishing them in and when they'll be available, the year. So it's important, whoever is reading will understand that you know what you're doing and that you publish works because it's one of the things that you would need to do in academia. Your work cannot end up just in a book. It needs, the, the entire world needs to know what you've done. So publishing is important. It's part of the academic process. Leadership voluntary experience, if any. So you need to tell us if you've led before and in what capacity. You also need to tell us if you volunteered with organizations and in what capacity. It's important to also tell us what you did for them. In that, that's why I said in what capacity. Don't just say, um, I was GIS expert for maybe Decagon, AI, EIA, 
limited and you stop it there it's not it's not nice you have to tell us exactly what you did like what was yeah what did you do if you volunteered so what did you do what were you doing were you the one drafting their gis maps maybe in a particular state maybe you were drafting gis maps of flood zones in akure put it there so immediately the professor knows that you probably know how to use ArcGIS or QGIS. You know how to use it. So if you've mentioned it in skills and competencies, he would see how you've applied it when you get to voluntary experience. Okay. He would know, okay. So when you wrote ArcGIS, competent user, ArcGIS, when he gets to voluntary experience, he would see that you volunteered with an EIA firm where you carried out some GIS mapping of an area. So that makes sense. He would trust the content of your document. And lastly, references. Now, when it comes to references, the, the rule has changed. I still see people make an error where they will put references and they will start putting Professor Thompson, CRCR, uh, Department of Ecology, uh, University of Benin. You will put his email, you will put his number. Please, all of that has stopped ever since um, there was an issue with data usage and the way we use data in public. So these days, data is the new goal that people are protective of data. As a result, you just don't release people's information anyhow. Your CV can end up with anyone. How do you know if that professor who has agreed to be your referee wants his details, including his number, to be everywhere? So as a result, modern CVs do not have all those details anymore. The moment you send your CV with all those information of your referees, to an employer and the employer sees them, the employer will know you are still living in the stone age. You have not updated yourself and that's not good for you. So the modern CVs do not have all of that because you have to protect data of your referees. So what should you do? You put the section referees and all you have to write is references will be available on request. That means if they want more information about your referees, they will contact you personally and say, Yes, give us more information about your referees. And then you send an email to them having all the details of your referees. And that's it. Not that you put it in this document that can end up anywhere. So that's the reason why that law has changed. So take note. All right, so let's look at typical corporate CVs. You would see that it's somewhat the same, but the, some things will change. Full name, same applies. Contact details, same rule applies. Now, there is no research interest. That has been replaced with summary or personal profile. Now, I've been privileged to meet some employers in my last five years in Nigeria and abroad. And I can tell you for a fact that they are becoming very skeptical about this section. The reason is because many people just write generic information, somewhat like a copy and paste. They are becoming very, very irritated. I will tell you, I've met a lot of employers. They are irritated by the summary section of many graduates. In fact, to the extent that they always say, can you even remove it? Delete it, we don't even want to see it. Delete it, because it's, um, it's somewhat like um, a generic information where you keep saying the same thing. They read A is the same thing they're talking about. They read from B is the same arrangement. They read from C is the same structure. And so they are so tired of it. But here is my advice. Don't take it out. Instead, repair the problem because there is a problem. Repair it. So don't take it out, but repair it. And I'll give you an example as we go on. So how do you repair your summary or personal profile? You personalize it. It should not read like someone else's. It should not read like anyone can fit in. It must read like you, Babajide Macaulay. It should not read like Thompson or Sarah. It should read like me. It's my story. Personalize it. That's the best way to handle your summary. Also, don't sound generic at all. It is the window into your CV. The moment they are not pleased by what they have read there, 
they probably will trash your CV and will not spend any time going through it. The moment they are not pleased, but so first impression is important. So you must work on that summary very, very well. And it must not be too long, please. Maximum of four lines, four lines, enough. Don't write a thesis, five, 500 words, please don't. Um, work experience is next. The rules apply. You must add responsibilities and achievements. I will tell you more about that as we go on. Professional qualifications. You can see that I replaced that with professional affiliations. In this case, you might probably need, it is more important to state your professional qualifications. For example, if you are looking for a job with uh, an HR firm, or you want to be employed into the HR department, you probably need to do something called CIPM. It's a very popular professional qualification in the HR world. So if you've done your CIPM, this is where to mention it and the year you took it as well. And if it's different organizations that handles it, mention the one that took yours. Now, if you're in the environmental space, HSC is something that will come to you very quickly. Health, safety, and environment, especially those in oil and gas and environmental safety or environmental sustainability, you will come across HSC. I'm an environmental guy, so I know this a lot. Now for HSC, there is one, two, three. If you've done HSC, this is where to put it. And if you are going for a role that has to do with environment, please, this is where to put it so that your employer can easily spot it that you have that done. Now, and this applies to every other important qualifications in your sector, please create a section called professional qualifications and slot them in. Then you can go to education because this is a corporate CV. So they probably want to see your work experience, um, your relevant qualifications before they come to what you really studied in school. Because as a matter of fact, some of you may have even switched fields. So that education might not be so important. That's why it's coming down to that point. So education, add grade if it's up to 2-1, be silent about it if it's less. Yes, just as I said, you want to put out your best foot forward. Skills and competencies, please include how you obtain those skills. It's very important. Awards, honors, recognitions. Same rule applies, same rule applies. Leadership, voluntary experience, same rule applies, just as I've told you earlier. References, same rule applies. Just say references will be available on request. Don't start putting all the details of your referees. Data protection, data protection. Think about that. Okay, so let's go to modern CVs. Now, certain things have changed from the 90s to now. If you are not careful, you will still be operating in the 90s. <laughs> so you need to know certain things that have changed and they must not um, appear on your CV. Because the moment they appear, the employer will not feel like taking you because the employer will think that you are still very archaic in mindset. So take note of them now. First thing first, personal details should not be added. Personal details like your gender, religion, marital status, tribe, state of origin, local government area. If you have all of this on your CV, please delete them immediately with immediate alacrity. Delete them because they are not needed anymore. Why are they not needed? I've heard a lot of people speak about this, but they usually don't tell you why. They'll just say it's no longer in modern CVs. Let me tell you why. Inclusivity is the reason. We now run a system in the world where everyone has to be included and, must, and it must not be discriminatory. As a result, we don't want to know your gender before we recruit you because it might build up in my sensibilities and I might be partial. I don't want to know your religion before I recruit you. Whether you are an atheist, a Christian, a Muslim, I don't care. What I care about is your competence to deliver the job. Marital status, whether you are married or not, I don't care. Although there are some jobs that would require this because they want to know. If that is the case, then you must probably tell them that. But not many will fall under that category. Now, tribe, who cares? 
We are so sentimental in this country, so tribalistic. Who, who cares? Why must you tell me if you are from the East or you are a Yoruba man? I don't care. If I'm to employ you in my firm, I don't care. <laughs> State of origin, what do I do with it? Local government area, do I want to give you a scholarship? <laughs> so all of these things are no longer necessary and they even take so much space. So please delete if you have them. I've come across hundreds of CVs. People still put them. That's why I am so passionate about this section and talking like this. People still add them, graduates still add them. If you are listening to me and you have them in your CV, please go and remove them immediately. They are no longer needed in modern CVs. Only contact details are needed. Your address, your email, address as well and your mobile number that is it so that they can reach out to you contact you that is it make sure that these information here make sure that they are functional please make sure they are functional don't put a mobile number that is stolen you've changed your number and you have forgotten to change it you must constantly update your cv because if they want to reach out to you that is the number they'll use in calling you. And if they keep calling you and it's not available, you might lose the opportunity. And that's your um, fault. That's your fault. So you must constantly update your CV. Ensure that you have replaced any number that you are probably not using anymore. You have replaced it with a new one, including your address. If you've moved um, from where you are to a new place, please change your address. Email, if you've changed your email, please. Rectify all of that. Constantly update your CV. Every work experience must be followed by responsibilities and achievements. I will show you how soon. Only relevant information should be added. Do not bombard your CV with information not needed for the role applied for. Do not think that it's about the quantity, just putting all kinds of things. It's not going to let you get it. It's going to make you look bad. So only the information you need that is relevant to that, that means you will have different versions of your CV. You will have different versions of your CV. It's so important. Have a folder and be renaming each of the files. You can say CV, KPMG, CV, FUTA, CV, Bank, CV, Total, CV, GTB. That will let you know that this CV is for GTB, is tailored fit for the role I'm, I, I am applying for at GTB. So you cannot have one CV to fit all. That's bad practice. Always remember quality over quantity. I've said that. Hobbies and interests are no longer needed these days. Hobbies, you know, I like traveling, meeting people, doing this. Please, nobody cares about that anymore. Hobbies and interests are no longer needed in modern CVs. Now, I need to stress something here. In a situation where the job and, um, expects you to know how to drive and wants to know whether you will be comfortable traveling, there is no need for you to come and put it in a hobbies and say, I love to travel and I, and I love to drive, no. In your cover letter, I will get to that because every CV needs to have a cover letter that will follow it. In your cover letter, that is where you will talk about the fact that you travel, you are well-traveled, you've been to several states, you like meeting people and, um, and you know how to drive and you have a driver's license. If these two skills are important, or these two interests are important for that job, then it's in your cover letter, you mention it. Don't create a section of hobbies and interests. No, don't do that. No longer needed in modern CVs. Names and contact details of referees should not be added. I've mentioned this already. Now, common mistakes to avoid. Quickly, I'll run through this because of time. Common mistakes to avoid. One, arrangement of your name. So I'm going to go deep into this now. For my name, Macaulay is the son name, Babajide is the first name, Milton is the middle name. I'm a Lagosian, just in case you are wondering why so many English names. The story for another day. <laughs> now, Macaulay Babajide Milton, Dr. Macaulay Babajide Milton, wrong. Do not put titles on your name. 
when you are writing your CV. Do not put titles. It's not necessary. If I want them to know that I have a PhD, they would see it in my education that I have a PhD. Don't put doctor. No, titles not necessary. We just need your name. Then, Macaulay Babajide Milton. Macaulay is the surname, but I did not put a comma. How will they know? If they see that, they will think Milton is my surname. Don't cause confusion. So make it clear. So the second one is correct. Let's look at the second line. Macaulay, comma, Babajide Milton. There's another way to write it. You can bold in that first one. Then they know it's your surname. Or capitalize it and they know it's your surname. If you don't want to start with your surname, then write it um, in the last way there, Babajide, Milton, Macaulay. Then automatically they assume that Macaulay is the surname. So this is how to write your name. You will be surprised that right from this portion of writing your name, you can start having an issue. Some of you will think this is irrelevant. It's not so important. <laughs> in a situation where you are applying to an organization like the World Bank, and the, the slightest error, you are out. Trust me, it becomes very important. Use of unprofessional email addresses. Baby for you. Sexy Julie 04. Miss Titi. Malian for life. You know, these are email addresses you opened. Maybe you were still in secondary school and you were so childish. Now that you're a graduate from the university and you need to act mature, you probably need to do away with all these email addresses and use your real name. In the Diawolo world, if it has been taken, you can use underscore. And if it has been taken, you can use another, you know, come across another thing or use a number at the end, maybe a year that you were born. You can add maybe 85, 86, 87, or 95, just to make sure that your full name stays in there. But the best thing is to have your full name. Like mine is Babajide Macaulay. At the time I took it, no one had it. So I'm, I thank God, because now there are a lot of uh, Macaulay Babajide out there. It's the Milton that stands me out. So use your name. When you use your name, it's even easy to remember your email. Just by remembering your name, they will remember your email than using all of these childish email addresses. So take notes. Two or three, adding personal information. I've said this already. Avoid all of that. Only put your contact details, address, email, and mobile number. Four, generic personal profile or summary. For example, this is a very bad one. I am highly organized, dedicated, mature, self-motivated, and agile. I possess strong interpersonal, organizational, people, communication, leadership, and analytical skills required to accomplish any task. This is so wrong on many levels. Let me start with level one. Level one, why so many synonyms and adjectives? Why? And this is what I see every day. Just because you are trying to put yourself forward as very good, this is a terrible way to go. Number two, you now said that um, um, you possess all these skills required to accomplish any task. That means you can do anything. Oh my good God. The worst part of all is to sound generic as if you can do anything. You are a master key that can open any door. That is a red flag to any employer. Very terrible. You must be specific at something that you do best at. There must be something you do so well at. So let's look at the second one that is correct. Now, this is a bit lengthy. You can keep it shorter. I just took this from one of our CVs that we have that I think was so good. And so the two of them are real. I did not make this up. I took them from CVs that we have in our archives. Yeah? This one you are seeing, the first one, someone wrote it. <laughs> this second one, someone wrote it, but I like it. It's long, it can be reduced, but I like, even if it is left this way, it's good. I like it. And I'll tell you why it's good. Sarah, so put your, um, describe yourself in third person. Sarah. 
is a medical labo uh, laboratory scientist with over four years experience. You must always mention the years of experience that you have because it helps the employer know how, how much um, or how long you have been in that space. And it helps him know how much training you probably need. So, and it's fine. If it's two years, it's fine. If it's four years, it's fine. But the employer knows the kind of expectation to have of you. You don't want to write eight years and what you really have is two years. Once you make him have a big expectation of you and you get there and you form boo, now you cause a move. Uh -huh. So Sarah is a medical laboratory scientist with over four years experience in medical diagnostics, specializing in clinical chemistry. You can see that she's talking about herself, very personalized. Presently, she works in one of the largest private medical labs in Lagos, Nigeria, where she conducts medical tests such as kidney, liver functioning tests, fasting blood sugar, and hormonal tests. She currently intends to further her competence in molecular diagnostics, therefore seeking for a master's degree in biomolecular science. So she's sending this CV to an academic institution, body, scholarship sponsor, or a professor. So this is a summary that can replace research interest because inside the summary, we can already see her research interest. So she wrote it like, um, she, she wrote it like a summary, not just stating the interest. And this is another approach, but you can see clearly it's going to an academic institution and it makes sense. Because now I know exactly who Sarah is. I know what she's done. I know why she's applying. I know the skill set she's trying to gain. Very clear and specific. Number five, incomplete description of locations. This sounds a bit, um, you might say, eh, is it so important? Yes, it is important. And I'll tell you why. Example one. Quality Assurance Officer, Kellogg, um, Kellogg Tolerant Nigeria Limited. That's all you wrote. That is all you wrote. Am I supposed to go to Google to find out where the organization is on your behalf? No, you're supposed to tell me the full address, full location. Quality Assurance Officer, Kellogg Tolerant Nigeria Limited, Lagos, Nigeria. You must tell me where it is. Another wrong approach. Lecturer, Federal University of Technology, Akure. You just assume that I should know where Akure is. No, tell me the state and the country. Akure is in Ondo State, Nigeria. Don't make assumptions. Your document should be um, foolproof. Foolproof. That means a fool should be able to understand it. Example three. GIS consultant, Decagon EIA Nigeria Limited, Delta State. I should also help, I should know where Delta State is. What if I'm a very big fool? <laughs> what if I don't even know? What if you are even sending this abroad? What if you are sending this to an, to an organization in the UK or in the US? They are supposed to know where Delta State is. You are going to tell us that it is in Nigeria. So please, full description of locations. Number six, work experience without responsibilities and achievements. For example, quality assurance officer, Kellogg Toleram Nigeria Limited, Lagos, Nigeria, 2018 to 2020. This is wrong. Why? You have not told us what you did in that role and whether you achieved anything. So you must add responsibilities and achievements. Now let's look at the responsibilities and achievements. You start it in an active verb and in the past tense because it's been done. We are in 2021. So you are probably in a new role. If it's a current role, then you put it in a present tense like coordinate, ensure. But if it's a past role, coordinated, please grammar is important to use your grammar right coordinated the processing and packaging of the instant noodles. Some people will say, coordinating the processing and packaging of food. Don't be generic. 
your document must never be generic in any way. It must be specific. You must tell us which food. Don't just say of oh, food. We know Kellogg is a food manufacturing industry or food processing industry. So don't come here to tell us food again. Come to tell us the exact food these people are doing. So this guy now is telling us that it's noodles. Ensured compliance with the best sanitation and hygiene practices. Prepared weekly, quarterly, and annual cleaning checklist for a team of 15 individuals. So be specific with numbers, use figures, so that we know how big the team is. Submitted quarterly reports to the quality assurance manager on all production and quality related issues. Awarded best performing employee in the quality assurance department in 2019. That's an achievement. Slot it in, let us know. Assisted in meeting the 2020 production targets, which is what? 120,000 cartons of instant noodles. Wow, that's a lot. So this person assisted because she was working in the assurance department, the quality assurance department, and she assisted in reaching their targets of 2020. So this is good. You know how to meet targets um, set by organization. The employer re reading this is already saying, I like this person. This person knows exactly why she's in a firm. You are in a firm to assist that firm, achieve their overall objectives. So you must be specific when you are writing responsibilities and achievement and write them in active verbs, just as I said. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they are very short, so I'll run through them. Abbreviations, avoid abbreviations, especially terminologies. You just expect people to know what EIA is. If I am not an environmental expert, I will not know what EIA is. EIA means environmental impact assessment. But if I am not in the environment field, I won't know. So write it in full at first mention. When you mention it at first, please write it in full. Then you can continue to say EIA. Don't assume that this is a popular abbreviation in my field. No, write it in full the first time and then write it in abbreviations uh, uh, subsequently. Now, eight, the use of excessive artwork or graphic designs. It's a CV, not a flyer. Not a flyer. Be creative, but don't be excessive. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Be creative, but don't be excessive. You know, I have seen all kinds of CVs where people are trying to show their graphical work. Please, if you know how to use Canva, it is not for you to display it on your CV. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, the simpler, the better. The simpler, the better. Now, adding photographs to CVs. Now, this may work with EuroPass format. In Europe, I'm certain, I've seen it, that the request that you have your, your photograph, it's even in the template. Your photograph will appear. However, this is not the format elsewhere. For example, in Nigeria, they will not ask you to put your photograph. So when you are putting it, you are going to, there will be lots of issues. So in essence, as I said, nothing is um, cast in stone. So you must constantly know what is obtainable in the country and in the sector so that you don't do something wrong. Grammatical and typographical errors. Ensure to spell check your CV after preparing it. You could give it to a friend to scrutinize it for you. 11, adding names and contact details of referees. These details should be removed. Only statements, references will be available on request should be added. I've said this several times because it's important. Some of you don't put page numbers because you forgot it. Font size are less than 10 because you are trying to squeeze everything into two pages. Don't do that. It should not be less than 10. Anything less than 10 is too small. I will have to really, really be squinting my eyes to read it. It's bad. So if you cannot get everything through in a page, if it's a resume or in two pages, if they ask you for two pages and it's longer than two, then it means something there needs to be taken out or needs to be reworked. Not that you now reduce the font size to less than 10, just to smartly squeeze everything in. If you do that, you're on your own because they'll trash your CV. Now, okay, so these are the three last slides and I'll be done. Three last slides and I'll be done because of time. So strategies to boost the quality of your CV. An excellent CV is tailored to fit a particular position being applied for. Therefore, you are supposed to have 
different versions of your CV, saved with specific names in order not to be confused. So you must have different versions of your CV because your CV must be written to fit a particular position. That means you remove all kinds of things for GTB. You add some, some kinds of things for KPMG. You remove some things again for footer. You must have different versions. You must have a folder that says CVs. You can't have one CV for every sector, every job, every company. Bad practice. And that's probably the reason why you've not been called back for an interview. Add a cover letter, not more than two pages long, to your CV, even when not told to do so, particularly for corporate CVs. Check Google Images for a cover letter template. There is a modern template. Cover letter is another discussion entirely. So because of time, I won't be able to go into it. But cover letters should be signed electronically. If you don't have an electronic signature, please create one. Sign on a sheet of paper, scan it, get it out, use remove background. Go to remove background on Google. You will get yourself onto a website. That website enables you remove that paper background, leaving behind just your signature. And then you can always slot in that signature onto documents. So have an electronic signature such that you can always place them on your cover letters. And then you submit alongside your CV. Even when you are not told to do so, always put a cover letter. It will not be at your disadvantage. In fact, it will let the employer say, well, this is good. I like this. And the cover letter will help the employer know um, more about you, especially how your skill set fits the role. Because your CV, you can't start writing, but you can now use your cover letter to now talk about some of those skill sets you've mentioned in your CV and how they will fit in, um, in, in doing your job if you eventually get that role. So that's, that's the cover letter. And lastly, your LinkedIn profile is somewhat an electronic CV. I'll prove that soon. Ensure to complete your profile and update it regularly. Important parts of your CV to LinkedIn. Now, look at all the parts, all the text that have been bolded. You will see that I lifted all of that from LinkedIn. Your LinkedIn profile has got all these sections about experience, education, licenses and certifications, volunteering, skills and endorsements, recommendations, accomplishments, topics for contacting, contact, interest. These are the sections in your LinkedIn profile. You can see that it's almost similar to all the sections I've been mentioning since. Your LinkedIn is an electronic CV. Your LinkedIn profile is an electronic CV. And it means that scouts can find you there. It means that employers can get you there. So in, in, complement, in complementing your CV, in complementing your CV, I would say that you should also have an active LinkedIn profile, complete, so that as you have the CV looking for a job or an advert to send it to, your LinkedIn is also there stations there in case something happens and someone is looking for see i have friends that have gotten jobs through linkedin they were found employers came said okay we can see that you have done this you've done that will you be free for a chat so that we can maybe through skype or zoom so that we can learn more about you and how you would fit our role because we need someone can you imagine they did not advertise but they went there to go and ask him if he's available, you know, for a role. But that's because they've seen his CV on LinkedIn. So please fill it up if you have not done so, especially for fresh graduates. About a professional summary of about 500 to 1,000 words. This has to be written properly, please, properly. Showing all your skill sets, um, the kind of roles you are available for, as well as what you've done so far. Work experience, put it there. So that experience should be your work experience. Lift the section of your work experience. Come and put it here. Education, degrees obtained, put it there as well. Licenses and certifications. This contains both your professional affiliations and qualifications. Please fix them in there. Voluntary, 
Take the voluntary experience from your CV. Come and fix it in there. Skills and endorsements. The skills and competencies that you have, come and fix them in there as well. Recommendations. Now, here, you have to look for people that are well-respected on LinkedIn. Reach out to them. Make sure you have a relationship with them. Make sure you are somewhat like a mentee to them. Now beg them and tell them to write you a reference on LinkedIn. And then they can write you something short. Imagine that someone that is well-respected is writing something about you and saying, oh, this person is great. He's your plug for anything that has to do with data analytics or business analytics. I can assure you that they will trust you more because of the credibility of your referee. So please ensure that credible people write stuff about you on LinkedIn and put it there as your recommendations. Accomplishments, fill this part carefully. Courses taken, take your time to fill it up. Academic papers published, fill it up. Awards won, recognitions, honors, please fill them up, update it as well. Topics for contacting. So these are things that you are available for. If you're available for mentorship, write it there. Consulting, write it there, please. Important. Because a lot of people have come to me with jobs just because they saw that. And they came to me with jobs. Yes, on LinkedIn, because it's right there. So this is marketing you already. It's marketing you online. Now, contact. This one, write in everything that needs to be filled in there. Like the link to your LinkedIn profile is actually there. Your email and your date of birth is there. Interests, courses you care about. This will also allow whoever is scouting understand you more. So things that they see that you that interests you must also match things that inspire you in your career. So they would see that there is a similarity. For example, I am an environmental expert. One thing you will see in my interest is environmental sustainability. So there is a match. There is a match. So they, they, they need to see that there is a match in there. And lastly, this should be my last slide. Yes. So lastly is improving visibility on LinkedIn. So it's not just enough to just fill your, your profile. You also need to make sure that you activate the open to work feature. There is a feature now on LinkedIn called open to work. You have to activate that feature that you are open to work so that employers can be aware that you are available for a new role. The feature also allows you to be seen by recruiters online. So activate your open to work, activate recruiters only so that recruiters will be seeing it. You are open to work. You also state what kind of work that you are interested in. So this is important. It helps visibility. Also, complete your LinkedIn profile. Many people don't have it completed. Please take time to complete it. Be active. Engage others. Put up posts when necessary. Be active. It's very important. Don't, don't just fill in your profile and disappear. Be active on LinkedIn. You could also post your CV and describe the kind of role you seek. This can quickly draw the attention of someone who is interested. This is also one way to go. Um, post your CV and describe. Please make sure the CV is good before you post it all. Because if you go and post a very bad CV, they will avoid you like a plague. Trust me. So make sure the CV is solid before you post it out there. And lastly, constantly check your LinkedIn inbox for important messages. Just in case a scout has come to write you and said, do you mind having maybe 30 minutes conversation on Zoom? And you will not read the message for an entire month because you don't check your messages. That will be terrible of you, terrible of you. So Constantly check your LinkedIn inbox listening, and I hope that um, I've been able to cover most of the things you guys are, are willing to see here or your expectations. I just hope I've been able to touch on your expectations when you decided to attend this virtual engagement. So thank you. Over to you, um, mod moderator.
Thank you so much, Mr. Um, I don't know for I don't know for others, but for me, it's more like I had to open my CV as you were speaking. I just look at you and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that ha ha moment. Oh wow. So this is what I've been doing wrong. I don't know if that happened to everyone, but that happened to me. And I must thank you so much for this great um opportunity. I will just quickly um, ask if there are questions. Um, I'm seeing a question here from okay. Modu Peomoni, and she says, should gender be involved in an academic CV, that is CV for scholarship application, or to a professor, or to a professor outside the country? I'll take it again. Should gender be involved in an academic CV, a CV for a scholarship application, or to a professor outside the country? No, no, that's what I was even emphasizing. I said you should remove all of that. Gender, um, um, what is it? Remove all of that. Now, I understand that question. Maybe it's the way she asked me. The question is probably, you, you know, there are some times when um, they would say they want females to apply for a particular thing. Or they might say females are encouraged to apply. Uh -huh. So in a situation where such is happening, you don't need to state it in your CV. When you are filling the application, they will still ask you for your gender and you click on female. So you don't need to put it in your CV. So they would know you are a female, definitely. So gender might be applicable in that sense. But if it's in your CV, please remove all those things. Only your contact details should be there. Uh, personal details should be taken off. Thought. First, the air. Okay, thank the you very air. much. Is there any other question? Does anybody have any other question? Yes, me. please. I have one question. All right. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. so much, sir. I really, really um, appreciate and I enjoyed the section. Um, my mm -hmm. question goes. Um, you talked about the academic CV and you talked about including maybe if you have a research um, published um, article or stuff like that, you should add it. My question is, what if your research work was never actually published? Should you still include it? Very, very good question. And I even missed it. I would have added it, but thank you, you brought it up. Now, if your research work has not been pu uh, published, but you have your dissertation. So the title should now be um, publication, thesis or dissertation, depending on what it's called. If it's a PhD, it's a thesis. So if it's dissertation, you just say dissertation, then you write the full title of your dissertation. And then you say that it was submitted to the department of so, 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 for the degree of bachelor's in so, so, so. So put, the title of your dissertation there, but give it a title, say dissertation, so that the person reading knows that that publication section, you have decided to put in your dissertation instead. So it makes sense. Just put the title of your dissertation if you've not published. Okay, thank you so much. Um, um, yeah. But because I'm talking, I'm talking of myself. I did a research um, during my undergraduate, uh, undergraduate studies, but then okay. my professor said it wasn't that credible because of the method that I actually used regarding to the topic. Okay. So it wasn't really published and he didn't accept it for publications. And that's why I'm asking, should I still yeah. include, include Yeah, it? so it is fine. Just make it a dissertation work. So the title will be dissertation and then put the title there. That's okay, it. Okay, okay. Thank yeah. you so much. So that's yeah, so that's fine. At least the professor who would see that would know that you have some research experience. You can um, um, execute a research project research from work. ideation okay. to completion. That's what it just means. But okay. don't leave it blank. Don't leave it blank. Put it there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other question? I'm seeing a hand by yes. something. Yes. Uh, thank okay. you so much, Dr. Macaulay. I really appreciate it. Though I came in late, but 
from where what I met on ground, it was amazing. Thank you so much, sir. So my question thank you, is, thank you. Uh, can we include a LinkedIn profile link on our CV or other our profile link that we pick? They can actually click to get um, um, other details about us or, or something like that. So that's my question. Thank yes, you. you can. Now, if it's a LinkedIn, because of the professional nature of LinkedIn, LinkedIn makes sense. But please, not Facebook, not Instagram. So if it is the link to your profile page on LinkedIn, yes, you can say a LinkedIn uh, uh, web page or website. Sometimes even on, in an academic um, um, CV, you can even put your Google Scholar link if you've published and you have a Google Scholar page with your publications. You can even put it there if it's an academic CV. If it's a work-related one, and you know your LinkedIn profile is solid, because that's another thing. If your LinkedIn's uh, 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 pro profile is, is poor, <laughs> and you go and put it there, you are shooting yourself on the foot. So, before you start advertising those things, be sure they are proper, they are decent, well done done then yes i agree you can put that because it's a contact information they can go there look at you and still use it to reach you so it's a contact detail it's a part of contact detail it doesn't really fall under personal information so yes linkedin would work i will not approve of um, other social media platforms um, and then i also approve of google scholar link if you have published and you have an existing page showing citations and all of that. Okay, thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Hello, sir. I have one more question, sorry. Okay. Can I go ahead? I okay. think I think this will be the last, this will be the last one because someone needs to start soon. You know okay, we okay. are two, and okay, so this okay. should be the last question. I'll just I'll rush. Okay. okay you right. um, um it's about the name the name arrangement. I didn't really get that part very well. Um, you talked about okay, bolding so, and using capital letter for your surname first before other names. So I want to ask: yes. Can I also use my first name, middle name, then my um last name? Is that okay too? Yes, 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 you can. I said all of that. So you can use your first name, middle name, and your son name. That's fine. Okay. So okay. that way, the moment we see your name, we know that last name is your son name. But okay. if you are starting with your son name, you should use a comma after it, or you should bold in it, or you should capitalize it. Uh -huh. Aha. Okay. So it's either one, but these are the different ways to write uh, your names professionally. Okay. okay, so that will be because of time, but I will just quickly want to address quickly some name, some some questions here. Please, is it advisable to include online courses taken in your personal CV? Yes, it is. You can. Uh, let me see. Please, can I include LinkedIn or online on my CV? Yes, you can. For academic CV, what is your research? What if your assignment was never published? Okay, I think I've answered that. Uh, perhaps uh, I have two official email addresses. Can I put the two email in the CV? Yes, you can, please. You can put the two of them. Um, please mention, we have another, okay, okay. All right, so thank you so much, guys. Uh, and that will be it from me. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I would like to leave um, the stage now for Boulevard Affair to come in. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Babaji. I like to call him a doctor because <laughs> even if it's not a CV, I have to put that um, important there. All right. Thank you so much. Please drop your LinkedIn um, link so um, they can follow your LinkedIn and also on Instagram. But now we won't use Twitter because I mean, situation of the country. Um, so up next, uh, is Boluwatife Ayinde. Boluwatife is a content developer and brand strategist and my resource professional with over three years experience. Um, she currently works in Jobaman as a human resource generalist. 
and you know she has background in communications and human resources and has worked with several brands from people in that backgrounds locally and internationally um so I've, uh, she also plans to expand her current career in human resources as i mentioned earlier before we started um this session so i'm going to bring her up quickly so that we don't take so much time and so many of the questions that you also need to get answered will be answered in this session and she'll also be giving us more insight into um job amounts how um, jobs come to be and those things that you can also help to search for jobs and how to get them all right so get um Bolo Atife on uh, Bolo Atife, please you have the floor thank you hi good morning everyone good morning can you see me and can you hear me clearly hello can you hear me Yes, good morning, ma'am. Yes, we can. All right, good morning. Please don't yes, call we me, can. ma'am. Make me feel very old. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yes, Susan. we can, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you, everyone, for also joining. I hope this it has been very impactful, you know. I had to listen to Mr. Macaulay, and I was like, hmm, he legit already said everything. But yes. You know, for benefit of those that were not here during the first session, welcome. And like I always tell people, please um, get a notepad and a pen because you will learn something. Why you think that um, you have a photographic memory or you will remember, there are some points you also need to take down. So you can quickly do that. Um, let me know when you see my screen. One minute, sorry. Still wants to shame me. All right. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see it from here. All right, perfect. So basically, today we're going to be talking about how to write a killer CV that commands attention. Now, I've had a lot of job seekers tell me, hi, Tife. Um, I've been applying for a lot of jobs and nobody's calling me for an interview. Nobody's reaching out to me. Guess what? Today, you're going to learn the art. The art. Mr. Macaulay already taught you how to do it. And, you know, I'll also just lay some emphasis on some things. And, you know, by hopefully by tomorrow, you will start. You know how to do that. Now, like I always do, I have ground rules try to be in a quiet place now physically and mentally i understand today is a saturday 11 30 you're trying to rest from school or work and all of that so while it is okay for your mind to you know to drift where i can say you are successful is you bringing your focus back to this section um, to this session so if you if you go off it's fine but always just try to come back here then if you know that you're in a noisy place, please try to like get a quiet room so that you can listen well. Now, I'm a fan of questions. So ask questions, even stupid ones. It will amaze you that those stupid questions are actually very important. So feel free to ask questions. Now, finally, pay attention to details. Like I said, details, details, details. You will need it eventually. Now, table of contents, basically, we have introduction, how to write a CV that commands attention, the difference between a CV and a resume, power phrases when writing your CV, how to network the right way, how to negotiate your salary. Now, my session expectations. I always ask people, why are you here? Today is Friday. You can be out with the girls, out with the boys, you know, out with your family members trying to cool off from the week. But here you are, 11.31 a.m. in this session. So please answer, you don't have to unmute your mic, but look within and ask yourself, why exactly am I here? Then two, what do you hope to achieve? Like, hmm, I'm here now, what do I hope to achieve? So I'll just give you like two seconds, think about it, write them down so that at the end of the session, you can let me know if I met your expectations, Right? Is that fine? Is that a good deal? 
Please, you have to be answering me. You know I cannot see you. It's only me that is here. So it feels like I'm talking to myself. Yes, it's a good day. All right. Thank you. Now, the learning outcomes. This is what I expect you to get from today's, you know, from this whole session. By the end of the session, one, you will learn how to write a C with a command attention. Two, you will learn how to network. And three, you will learn how to negotiate your next salary. Don't forget, this is just me saying, this is what I want you to learn from today's session. You still have your own expectations. Oh, why am I here? What do I want to achieve? So there are still two different things. One is my perspective and the other is your own perspective. So, yep, and we are going to start. Now, introduction. An average recruiter looks at a CV for six seconds. It's amazing, right? Um, I put out a job ad, I get like 1,000 applications and I'm like, how do I go about this? I didn't even know about this until one day I was just, you know, reading through the applications and someone was behind me. I was like, wow, Tisha, you actually just looked at each CV in like six seconds. How do you do this? And I'm like, well, when I started, I would first of all sit down, go through the whole CV, you know, try to say, oh, this person is a fit, this person is not a fit. But over the time, I did this continuously, continuously, then I became, you know, I had more experience, I knew what I was looking for, and I knew where I was going to find it. So what am I saying? Think of, think of yourself as a brand, right? I am a brand. How do I market myself in the professional world? Your CV. Nobody knows you, you know. I don't know you from Adam. You are there, I'm here. But how will I know you? How will I get interested in you? How will I want to know more about you? It's if I see your CV. And that is why today we're saying how to write a CV that, you know, commands attention. Now, I've had a lot of people, to be very honest, you know, I was once in your shoes. When I was in school, I didn't know how to write a CV. And it was just more like, well, you're done with school now. You need a CV, you know, to apply for jobs. I couldn't do it myself. And I had to reach out to a friend like, oh, yo, I have a problem. I need to, like, I need a CV. And, you know, he just told me, oh, send your details. And he wrote it for me. And, you know, not everybody has a friend that can write, like, a professional CV. But that CV got me my first job. Yay. So what am I saying? You have to market yourself the right way. Imagine a brand now. There's a new brand. Let me see one. Um, Super Commando that they're advertising now. Who knew Super Commando before the um, Big Brother reunion? Nobody. But now everybody is watching it. They decided to place an advert because they knew that a lot of people would want to watch the Big Brother Niger reunion. So they put it there and now I can be like, oh, super, 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 I legit will even follow you to sing the song. Not because I'm interested in the product, but because they were able to, you know, advertise themselves. It caught my attention. So yes, I know that there's something called that dream. When you're writing a CV, you know, Mr. Macaulay has already given you the details, everything in and out, how you should do this, academia CV, you know, professional CV, he has already done that. But you, once you do that, you'll be able to attract the right people, attract the right job. They'll be able to look at your CV and be like, oh, I, I should call him. Like, I want to know more about this guy. I want to know more about that guy. So I say here, if you want to perfect your CV, you might have to breeze up your elbows, get your reading glasses, and make sure every little detail is polished to perfection. Why did I say that? Your, your name? We're not interested in if you're Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, we don't care. But some companies do, and they're going to tell you, preferably should be a Yoruba you know, person. They will let you know. Your address, we care. Because imagine me trying to recruit for a client, and you live in Ipaja, my client is in Yeki. I wouldn't want to put you through the stress, because one, I'm going to look at the salary my client is trying to pay. I'm not going to put you through the stress with traveling all the way from Ipada down to Lekki every day on maybe like a 50k salary. So, you know, those are things that they're actually going to be looking at. Your professional summary is very interesting. And to be very honest, I think that is where I mostly dwell. Because if you can sell yourself in a professional, like your prime, your professional summary, I can tell, oh, this guy is um, into media and advertising. This is not what I want. So I'm just going to close it. So when you sell yourself there, it just, you know, take it saves time your educational background 
very important as well. Um, your professional experience, very important. So to conclude this, you know, what I'm saying now, this introduction, try to equip yourself with value and knowledge. Whatever you do, wherever you find yourself working, it might be at your mom's shop or your dad's, um, um, your dad's office, anywhere you find yourself, literally, try to equip value. You might be a fresh graduate and maybe you were not fortunate enough to you know, do um, IT and then you're like, oh, it just dawned on you like, oh my God, I'm done with school. I need to have a CV, well, guess what? I don't have any experience. But how will you build your experience? You go and, you know, of, oh, daddy, can I help you? Let me just do this for you. You know, it's great for three months just to, you know, grow up myself and blah, blah, blah. If you equip yourself with knowledge and value, then you will have something to write in your CV that will make people attracted to you. If you do not, then why should I open your CV? What makes you different from every other person? I hope you understand. Now, Mr. Macaulay already talked about the difference between a CV and a resume, so I'm not going to dwell on this. It's just English, really. In Europe, same thing, CV, resume. And you know we follow UK, so when some people say CV, when some people say resume, we literally mean the same thing. Now in the US, a resume is a one-page summary of your work experience and background to the job you're applying for. Straight to the point, one page. So imagine, you might have 15 years experience, 20 years experience, I just need one page. It's a resume, one page, stick to it. So you will have to go straight to the point, hit the boom, you know, hit the nail on the head. Now, while a CV is a longer academic diary that includes all your experience, publications, and more, so you can go into details like, okay, so I worked here, I worked there, I worked this, you know, give them more details. But like we always tell people, please and please and please ensure that your CV is no more than three pages because I'm a recruiter. Just to fill one rule, I have 1,000 applicants. I'm looking for one person. How many percent is that? And then your CV is like a, is a diary of like maybe 10 pages. Hello? I will just get discouraged and you know, move to the next person. So now, why we're here. How to write a winning CV. Do's and don'ts of CV writing. Now, I have a lot of people that, you know, you ask me, should you put pictures on your CV? To be honest, I'll say no, because the human nature is funny. You don't know the recruiter's mood. You don't know if the recruiter is happy at that moment or the recruiter is sad at that moment. And then you have a picture on your CV smiling. And in my head, I'm like, why is this person smiling? You didn't offend me, but my mood there you might want to say, oh, you shouldn't put emotion to things, but let's not be lying. A client just called me now to shout at me like, oh my God, I've been expecting this, I've been expecting that, and he didn't give me, he didn't do that. And I'm like, oh, let me just get on it. And I just see one smiling person, I'm like, ew. And I just move to the next person because at that moment, I don't need your smile. So we, I always tell people, please take your pictures away. Now, if it's a modeling job, they will ask you for pictures. That's different. If they need your picture, they will ask you for it. But in a situation whereby they don't need your picture, please don't put your picture on your CV. There's some companies that are particular about all oh, the type of people they want to employ. You're not gonna put it, they will not judge you. I know some people are not photogenic, some people are photogenic. So just you know, save yourself the stress and don't put it. Now, I'm going to itemize how you know, we write it. Mr. Macaulay already said it, but for the benefit of people that are not here, I will just run through it. Now, your name, right? That's my name. So I can write that in caps, my son, my son name, or you can, you know, you know, um, put it in bold. Or you can go Boluatife Oindamala Aindi. That's my name. So I put that there. Then I put my address underneath my address. So this this part, like this is like your bio, really. It's in the middle, your personal details. That's the right word. It's in the middle. So your name. Then your, um, then your address. Now, I've had a lot of questions where people say, oh, you know, the, with the current things happening in Nigeria, is it still safe to put your address there, blah, 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 blah. If you feel unsafe, I would advise you, you can just put, okay, I need to go to Ipaja, maybe Barua Ipaja. 
it's a location that's where I stay. So the recruiter still understands that, oh, this person stays in Ipata. I have an idea of where you stay. So that because they don't have time to buzz you like, oh, hello, Bulwati Fair, he's where you live. They don't have that luxury of time. So just put it there, Barua Ipata, they can see it. The next is your number. Job seekers, please. I get confused really when people put two numbers. I get how it is. Sometimes the network is not good, right? But it's, what is frustrating the most is you put two numbers and I'm calling the two numbers and you're not picking. You'd never call me back. I'm trying to schedule you for an interview. I call you day one. You didn't pick, you didn't call back. I call you day two. You didn't pick, you didn't call back. That's a lot of luxury, man. There's, there's no time for it. So try to put one number that you know that is always with you. One number that is always with you. Put it there. Now, I advise people to use the, you know, your country code plus two, three, four, because you don't know where your CV is going. You do not know where your CV is going. I have people, friends that are just like, oh, Tiffa, I'm looking to recruit for this role. Do you have help? Can you recommend anybody? If I have your CV and I'm like, oh, this person is a good fit, I can send it. Now, imagine if the person is outside the country. He knows that, oh, this is a Nigerian number that he has to call. It just gives him an idea. It makes it, you know, very easy. Then you put your email address. Like Mr. Macaulay clearly stated, if you do not have a professional email address, please create one. Gmail is very friendly. They are not charging you anything. Just go there, open a new email address, and you know, put it on your CV. Don't let us be seeing things like your favorite last finger at gmail.com or too hot to handle at gmail.com. Don't need to be saying funny things like that because in my head I'm already like, wow. Um, you're a graduate now, actually. If you're in secondary school, I understand that, mm, well, it's still, you know, you're still trying to be youthful, but you're a graduate. So be professional. Go and open a professional CV. You can use, um, you can use numbers in the sense that Mr. Macaulay said, when he did his own CV, right, nobody had taken the name. But guess what? They give back to people every second. So somebody else will come now and go and write Baba Dede Macaulay. It's already taken. So you can do Babadide Macaulay 01 or Babadide Macaulay 6. Something, just, you know, use the number and yes, at gmail.com and you're fine. Now for people who are active on LinkedIn and you know, LinkedIn is social media. You can put literally everything that you want. All your rubbish, you can put it on there. It's fine. It goes because nobody's going to judge you based on that. So you can put a link to your LinkedIn profile also there. So if, as a recruiter, I'm interested, oh, this person's CV is nice, because I'm saying that your CV is three pages, I will go to your LinkedIn profile to see more, to get more, to know more about you. So yeah, I'll just click it, mm, okay, so this is what he's doing, you know, blah, 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 and you know, we are good. So that is for your personal details. Now, don't in your personal details, don't tell me you're from a team. Don't tell me you're a Christian, don't tell me you're a Muslim, don't tell me you're married or single, or divorced, we don't need all that, right? If anybody needs maybe personal details, when you are applying, they will tell you to write if you're a male or a female. They will tell you to write your age. We don't need your age, right? And people are very funny. When you want to write, maybe like, oh, I was born 1996. And they look like, ah, I don't think she can do the job. People are actually funny. So don't put all those things, don't give them a reason to ignore your CV, right? It's just like saying um, you want to watch a movie, right? It's the trailer you watch first. So that's how your CV too should be. Give them suspense. Hmm, I need to know more about this person. And then the interview comes in. All right, so once we're done with that, they're coming to your, prof um, your um, profile summary, your career, that's your professional summary. And please, and please, and please, don't use words like about me or meet Boluatife. Be professional about it. And the reason why I'm saying this is because of the ATS, the applicant tracking system. The applicant tracking system is so professional and you know, words imputed are already like professional summary. So when you write about me, it doesn't read it because it's not the same thing. It's a machine, it's not human. And that is why a lot of people are not getting uh, in, um, interview in, invitation. So use professional summary, right? And then this professional summary, it is like your, your 
two minutes elevator pitch. Straight to the point. Right in third party. Third party, let your years of experience show, let some of your skill sets show, if possible, the industry you've worked in. Let it reflect there. You know, it's just like a snippet of who is Bolo Matife. That is what it should be. We don't advise it, we don't advise people to write like a whole lot. No, we're not to write an entire biography. Make it short and precise. If you're a marketing person, what would catch my attention is numbers, right? So you will say something like, oh, I um, successfully launched the first, um, the first career fair, um, virtual career fair that had, you know, over 10,000 people. I'm like, ooh, nice. For a marketing person, I'm like, ooh, nice. So those are things like you want to show. For salespeople, numbers. Now, you are not allowed, don't forget, be professional. You're not allowed to disclose the, um, the amount, right? But guess what? You can use percentage. Oh, um, I increased the prime, the, um, the company's income, maybe revenue by 40%, you know, blah, 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 like that's there. Put it there, don't put I, like I said, it's third party that you're writing it. So put those things there, things that will literally attract them, like to go further to see, oh, who is this person? Now, oh, sorry, before then, I think you should put your area of expertise. So that's, let me go again. Once you're done with your personal um, information, the next thing should be your, oh yes, it's your professional summary, then your area of expertise, right? Now, what is area of expertise? Is your soft skills and your hard skills. We don't want you to just come and tell us that effective communication, hello? Anybody can be effective. Like it's something that, like, it's a skill. I can learn it, I can teach you. It's basic. It is not, wow. Because some people, when they write, oh, effective communication, and I'm in an interview with them, and they're still bragging, oh, effective communication. I'm like, hmm, all right. Because right now, I don't think this is effective, but it's fine. If you feel like that's your skill, by all means. So look for hard skills that will push you. I'm into HR. I'm going to say onboarding and offboarding. You know, it's a term. Anybody that is in HR will look at it and be like, oh, nice. Employee engagement. I'm going to pull that there. And they're like, oh, nice. I'll tell you payroll management. And you basically be like, uh -uh, she can even do payroll. So look for what is peculiar to the industry you're working, you're, um, working with. If you're in sales, you know, you talk about revenue, you talk about leadership, you talk about management, you know, building the team. There are lots of things you talk about. You talk about persuasion. If you're in marketing, you talk about B2B, B2C, depending on, you know, what you're trying to work on. You talk about a lot of things. So all you have to do, Google is your friend. Go on Google and, you know, write it. Oh, marketing terminologies. Read about it. Is this a skill that I have? and you're fine. And one thing I also do is when I write CVs for people and you know, I'm trying to you know, make your CV look very interesting, I send it back to you and I tell you, please go through the skill sets I put there for you. Is this something you can do? If you say no, by all means, I'm ready to remove it and put something else that you can do. So do not lie because if you lie, they're going to catch you. If they catch you, you're going to lose your job, right? So be realistic, mix it. Soft skills, hard skills. What are the soft skills we are looking for? Hiring managers are looking for. Um, HR people are looking for. Teamwork. They don't teach teamwork in school, right? You put it there. If you know how to work in a team, put it there. Oh, teamwork. I'm like, oh, nice. Interesting. Put effective communication. Like, it's not, I'm not saying you should get a 10 over 10, but it's something that you should know or build over like, oh, I need to get better at this. I need to get better at this. Time management, because we're paying you for coming to the office, we're paying you. Those are the type of skill sets we need to see. So right today, advice again, you shouldn't be more than eight. So you can pick four hard skills, four soft skills. Hard skills are basically your technical skills. So that's what I said, like terminology, what is um, relating to your industry. Soft skills are the skill set that they don't teach in school, but are very vital to the you know day-to-day -day running of the business, 
Right, cool. So now we're coming to your experience. Put it there again, like I said, eight years experience, work experience. Then you start. I'm currently working with Jobberman Nigeria, right? So I'm going to put Jobberman Nigeria. You don't need to write the address, the address of Jobberman Nigeria. If anybody wants to Google what Jobberman Nigeria is into, you take, you go ahead and go and do that in Google. You find out and you're fine. So I go Jobberman Nigeria. Then I write my position, HR generalist, right? Then I write the date, the month I joined, that's September 2019, till date, because that is where I am. Then you can now come and see my daily deliverable, what I do on a daily basis. So, and here we advise people to write in continuous tense. So if you are saying, it's basically ING. So recruiting and scouting, selection and, you know, selection and hiring, things like that. You put it in continuous tense because this is what you do every day, every day. So put it in continuous tense. Like I said, please don't go and carry your entire JD and dump it there. No, don't do that. Look for something that will attract the hiring manager, the recruiter, because you are trying to save their time. So you to go through it and be like, oh, if I see my saving now, Will I push my CV to a client for a job? Ask yourself that honest question, right? So once you're done, you go to the Nexus. So basically, it's the latest to the farthest. And we always advise people to um, tailor their CV. So for example, me now, uh, I interned at Los in Thomas and Advertising. I was a strategist. I, I was a reporter in LTV one time. I have, a lot, I have a lot of that. Now, if I'm going to apply for an HR job, I'm not going to put those there because it's irrelevant to the position I'm applying for. I'm not emphasizing on them, right? Now, what you can do if you feel like you don't want to be like, oh, so all my experience from 2006 to 2000, uh, to 2000 uh, let's say eight, it's not showing that I did anything there. You put out and ask me questions that what were you doing this time? There is a small, just one line for other experiences. Other experiences, same thing goes as your the company, the role, that's one line. So the company, the role, the year, that's all. The company, the role, the year. And it already just adds up your years, like all the years for you. Then you're good to go with that. Now, once you're done with that, you're coming down to your um, educational history, that's your educational background. PC also use terms that the ATS can reach. Once you get there, you start, if you've done your PhD, that's what's come first, then your master's and your BSc. Some people want to put their um, secondary school. Please don't put your primary school. Please, please, please don't put your primary school, all right? We don't need that. Yeah, we understand you graduated, but please don't put that there. Then when you're done, you can then put your trainings and certifications, three pages. Like Mr. Macaulay clearly stated, you try to use fonts. We, I use from 10. I use 10. But if I feel like ah, this person has like a lot and I want to you know, showcase this person more, I'll reduce it so that it wouldn't exceed the three pages, right? So if you have over 15 years of experience, we can dash you one more, just one, one more page. That's four pages. But try to just squeeze it and put those um, deliverables as things that can sell you not basic things like uh, followed up with marketing, following up with marketing. Okay, that's basic. Following up with marketing, all right, what's next? Do you understand? So put things that can sell you. And like I said, sales, marketing, we need digital marketing actually too. We are fascinated with numbers. So put your numbers there, let it show. And you'll be amazed at how many people will actually reach out to you when you do that, right? Now, um, Please don't put your hobbies on your CV, right? Don't put your hobbies on your CV. Don't put your referees. If I need, if we need it, we'll ask you for it and you know, you just send it to us and we'll do it. Reason being that some people are very funny, right? I might be selfish and I'm like, oh, uh, hey, so his referee is in Slum BG. Hmm. I'm trying to get into Slum BG and they'll call the person and they'll use it for other things putting your name, you might not know about it. So it's a lot of, you know, people are very, very funny. So please don't put that, save like 
safe people as well. I think that's the word. Um, for people that want to get creative, right? for like people in the creative industry, I get how creative you are and you want to make your CV look like purple, pink, blue, white, all those colors. Please just stick to your professional format, to be very honest, because sometimes the fonts that you use, because it's, it is definitely a template. And when you do it, it limits a lot of things. You can't put a lot because if you check it, most of those CVs are always one page. Okay, one page actually. So it's always one page. And when you see it, you're like, it doesn't even sell you well. So just try to stick to the normal Microsoft Word. Simple. And let me just give you an expo into the ATS, right? Now, since we're still on CV, this is just bonus. The ATS is, is, is a machine. Right. I won't say it's a, it's a machine, Sha. Tech. You, it's an app. Let me use it. An app for fit is better. I go as a recruiter into the ATS machine. I load my job description there. And I load things that I'm looking out for. In simple terms, it's control F. Control F that I'm doing on the 1,000 CV. That's the 1,000 applications that I get. If I cannot find the keywords I put there, then there's no point of me your CV will not be seen. I won't find you because I'm trying to save my time. The ATS will prioritize the people that have what I'm looking for and you move on. So here comes to when you're writing your CV is work because for every job, and I say every job you apply for or you want to apply for, you have to go through the job description, look for in your head, discern what, oh, what are the keywords I can use here? Check the competencies, the skills and competencies part for what the person is looking for. Look at the um, daily deliverables of that, that they put there. Try and put it in your CV so that when the recruiter is using the ATS, it will find you. Please don't lie because they will catch you if you lie. If I ask you a question, if you say, oh, Somebody, uh, I'm interviewing you and I'm like, oh, rate your Excel skill. And you're like, ah, my Excel skill, I'm a nine over 10. And I ask you something, maybe a pivot table. And you're like, well, I can't do it. How did you rate yourself a nine over 10 in Excel? So be realistic, right? With that, that's how the ATS works, literally. And if you don't use the professional keywords as professional summary, educational background, and all of that, it won't find you and it will not prioritize you. So I can see some of you will be like, oh, maybe this is why they are not finding you. Yes, this might be literally why they are not finding you. So remove, and uh, people that used to grade themselves, I used to ask a question, how did you grade it? So when you see Microsoft's word, you see zero, 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 zero. And they'll put, um, let's say digital marketing, zero, zero, they'll put two, zero. And I'm like, what metrics did you use to get this result? And then they're like, uh, they come on assignment. So I'm like, so even what you did here, at, at the end of the day, it's still rubbish. So please just try to be straight to the point, direct, and you know, give them a bit of suspense because it's not like you're giving them the entire gist of your life. When they call you for an interview, then you can unbrag, tell us more about you. Then you go, oh, I did this, did that. By all means, feel free, it's your time, all right? Now, power phrases when building your CV. Like I said, there are some things that recruiters look out for. When I see that your professional summary is interesting, like I'm like, oh, nice, at least out of 100, this is the first CV that I've seen that I like, then I'll also go down into details. Now, for example, I say provide strong evidence of specific accomplishments, specific. One time we had to recruit um, graduate training for Union Bank and the application was it blew, like it was a lot. If you check on my CV there, one of my accomplishments is that, because we were able to pull that in like two weeks, right? So be specific so that they can see it. And one thing I didn't mention before is for every role that you have, like for every yeah, role, job that you do, have an accomplishment. It's fine to you or uh, you might feel like it's not a big deal Imagine you saying, oh, so I launched, I um, took this, um, how, how do you say this in English now? 
basically getting a new market, a new territory where you're able to move your, your products from 2% to like 15% and all that. Put that as your achievement there, no matter how small. Put it, every job, show them that, oh, I have an achievement on this role. So put it there so, then, so that they can see. So this also falls under your achievement, right? Now, effectively communicate management decisions to achieve understanding and acceptance. This basic, this sentence basically is like stakeholder management, right? Which will also appear, if you deal with stakeholders, should also appear on your um, area of expertise. So these are things that people are looking out for. Effectively blend management skills with technical expertise. These are, just go through them, delegate to maximize organizational strength. These are just a few that I put. They are a lot. Effectively develop individual departmental and organization goals to obtain objectives. And let me tell you another thing that attracts people to you is working to achieve the company's goal, not working to make myself shine, right? Working to achieve the company's goal. So whatever you do, ensure that one, the company is at my best, like the, it is in the best interest of my company, my organization. Because that's what it's going to say, why should I hire you? If whatever you do is not in my, it's not going to favor the organization. So always try to like, you know, put that there. Now, CV plagiarism. And this is very funny because um, when I was preparing for this slide, I didn't put it there. And, you know, Tim Tope, yeah, he was like, oh, I think they should talk about CV plagiarism. And I was like, is there anything called CV plagiarism? So I went to do my research, and guess what? There's actually something called CV plagiarism. It shocked me. I was in shock. So you might be in shock. It's allowed. Me too, I just found out. Um, so I put here, checking for plagiarism eliminates candidates who are dishonest and do not have the skills necessary for the position. This is simple. Everybody, okay, maybe not everybody here would have you know, written maybe a project work or a dissertation, anything like that. You might have not done that. But if you have, you know, how plagiarism is a big deal. In Nigeria, sometimes they play down on it. But when you go to the UK, when you travel, once you leave the four corners of this country and you plagiarize anything, it comes with a penalty. And that's why we're teaching you plagiarism because guess what? Everybody wants to chakwa, you want to leave Nigeria, it's fine. But have it at the back of your mind that there's something called civil plagiarism. And just like the eight years, right? Um, recruiters will also upload your CV. So for people that used to copy people's CV, this is where they catch you. Because I'm now looking at two CVs, two exact experience, exact professional summary, exactly the same thing. Then I'll know that one person copied the other. I won't know who copied who, but if I feel like, why am I inviting both of you? Like, I don't even know which one is the original state. Person just leave it and guess what? You will not get the job. It's fine for you to have like somebody's CV. Oh, I need people. Ah, Tiffany, please can you send me your CV so that I'll be able to build my own? By all means, take it, have it. But it will be wise for you the way people used to copy people's assignment that you they will tell you change the words. Please ensure you change the words. Now I'm not saying she go and copy someone's assignment, but change the words to fit who you are. Do you understand? and you get the job. So TV plagiarism is actually real. And it can, you know, it can limit you from getting a job, really. Cool. So yeah, this is where I will now focus on because, you know, we've been talking about CV since like 10 o'clock. And let's talk about network. How to network the right way. A lot of people don't know that. Hmm. Let me say 70% of the jobs available are not, are not advertised. People leverage on their networks. So let me give you an example. Last week, a colleague of mine comes and like, oh, HR, we need your help. We need to um, employ for this particular role, and um, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, when do you want the person to resume? And she was like, she wanted the person to resume on Thursday. That's July 1st, and I'm like, July 1st, uh, uh, uh. I was like, okay, no problem. So they went, you know, they sourced, asked people around, sourced for CVs, however they did it. But the person in charge of that interview was, was sick. So guess what, they landed on my desk. And I'm like, all right, 
because you need this urgently, I'm going to prioritize it for you. And I went ahead and scheduled about eight candidates for this particular room. I needed two people. The first, the first one, the first interview came. The person came on, did rubbish. And I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, this is one out of eight now. Second one, rubbish, 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 rubbish. And I'm like, by default one, I'm like, yo, this is legit two hours of my life that I could have used to do something better. These people are not helping me and I cannot. Like at this point, I've canceled everybody like in my head for this batch. I don't think I can see anybody I can hire here. So I go on WhatsApp because there's no more Twitter. I go on WhatsApp and I'm like, yo guys, I need your help. I need this, 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 this. Um, the person is to resume immediately. And guess what? People just say, say, oh, I have somebody. I have somebody. I have somebody. I say, and I say, getting CVs. I say, getting CVs. I say, getting CVs. Guess what? That's my network. I leveraged on my network. So you might not know the power that you have. It's so funny how somebody will send somebody else's CV. You don't even know about it. Then I'll let you know that, oh, this person can fly. This person cannot fly. But that's pretty much about it. So now, what are the things you need to know? And I need to make you understand something. COVID was a blessing in a way that I want you to see. This is what I'm going to explain to you now. Normally, everybody, when I was in school, when I came out before COVID, I used to think that, oh, before you can network, you have to go for all these career fair, you know, go for all these conferences so that you'll be exchanging, um, uh, what do you call this thing? Your cards with them. <laughs> like, it was, a, it was a big deal. But guess what? COVID happened. Nobody could come out. But things still had to go on. And we started leveraging on social media. That's LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever app you can actually, Telegram. We started leveraging on it. And it was a blessing in disguise because I don't have to exchange contact with you, but just joining a professional channel on LinkedIn, a professional group on LinkedIn, commenting on the group, it's enough to make a recruiter notice you. Notice your ideation process. Imagine you commenting, um, commenting back to back. It's just knowledge, right? Oh, a recruiter puts out something. What do you think about this? You, you are just scrolling. I'm just here for the pictures and you're just really scrolling. Meanwhile, you're meant to actually think about it and you know, answer, oh, I think this, 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 this. People will start noticing you. And if you, if you use LinkedIn very well, you will see something that you uh, people check your profile. So this person checked your profile. You might not know exactly who, but they'll tell you someone just checked your profile. It's based on, say, you've written something that, hmm, nice thought process, and I'm looking out for it. So now I just have four steps here. Start networking before you need it. Don't wait for the right time. There's never a right time because it, like, there's never a perfect time for you to say, oh, I want to network. Now, a lot of my friends see me say, ah, to say, you know a lot of people, like you know everything from even mechanic now, and I ask you, you know. And I'm like, I'll be a mother one day. The life my father gave me when I wanted to do internships and all of that, not too bad, but all I had to do was give him my IT letter. And guess what? When they are resuming on Monday, that was it. And I'm like, it was such an easy one, and I want to do the same thing for my children. So whatever you know, connection that I need to build now that will help me later in life, I will do it. And to, you know, it's just come on, it's me. So don't wait for it. Don't say, I don't need a mechanic because I don't have a car, right? You can make friends, like I make friends with anybody. So go ahead. Networking is just big grammar. It's just having communication, friendship. But well, because we are being professional, we say networking. So don't wait till you see the MD of the bank and say something, something. You know this song that, sounds, that someone sang just to be on, on, on a lighter note. Do you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody? Actually, it works. It's somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that, knows somebody that might be holding the key to where you're going. So start networking before you need it. How do you do that? On, on, um, on LinkedIn, join professional networks, I said. Take time to comment, to like. It's fine. You can be direct. Go to them directly and be like, oh, hi, my name is Tife, you know, and I know this, I know that. Like, before you do that, you know what will interest the recruiter? Go through the post the recruiter 
as you know the, the post that's the recruiter's post what industries does the um, recruiter work on try to just find out more so it's just basically what's this word now it is um to establish rapport you're trying to find out something so it's like say for girls now if you want to start talking to girls you'll be like oh nice shoes and the girl is like ah oh, thank you and guess what oh my name is to say and conversation starts like that so you start like that too with a recruiter oh um okay nice and you go on and on oh just decided to you can even be like oh great work i see your work every time and i just wanted to commend you great work you're doing you do know you're doing a um, a big thing out there somebody might not be noticing but i can see it and i just wanted to commend you today interesting that might make the recruiters day and from there boom you guys are friends and later on you're like ah oh, my i'm just looking to change industry um and the person's like, oh, what industry are you looking at? The person say manufacturing, you're like, oh, send me your CV. That's how it happened. So don't wait before you need it. People buzz me on Instagram. I need a job. And I'm like, okay, you're not the first person that needs a job. <laughs> Come on. Do you understand? I'm not your personal recruiter. You're not paying me. I'm not doing anything. You're just coming to me. I need a job. Hello? Please, I'll just tell you, go and apply. That's literally it. Now, don't always ask for a favor. Don't always come and say, I need a job. I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. It's frustrating. And what frustrates recruiters the most is when you meet a new person and the person literally turns you to their recruiter. Oh, my family member, my cousin is looking for a job. My, um, something is looking for a job. And in my head, I'm like, we just met like two minutes ago. Can you give me a break? I meet you at games night and you're already on about, oh, my family is looking for a job. I'm at games now because I don't want to think about work, right? So yeah, please don't always ask for a favor. Now, always tell yourself, I must still be at games now. I am selling, maybe we're playing chess. And I'm like, oh, nice move. You know, ah, you can just be like, ah. when you're a salesperson, what do you think? Slow and steady, you know, you'll be able to be pitching yourself like that. So don't always just even go and meet it. I'm like, one thing, I need a job, help me. No. What can you do? Why should I help you? Because truth be told, low-key, you're helping the recruiter because if I have a role and you're good, you're a good fit, I don't have to go waste one hour trying to source for a candidate, right? But also be more strategic about it. Now, get your CV ready. I had a session yesterday and I was talking to the head of recruitment and I was like, oh, how often should people um, review their CVs? And guess what? She said, as many times, like once you learn a new skill, you should update your CV. And I actually was like, yeah, that's right. Because here I am trying to put someone on LinkedIn and I'm like, oh, please, uh, you've had a conversation, you're interested in the role. And I'm like, oh, next step is for you to send me your CV. And the person goes off for like two days, two, three days. And in my head, I'm like, yo, it's just a CV for you to send. So if you review your CV, every time you learn a new skill, you're like, oh, okay, this will look good on my CV. Go ahead, update your CV. Keep it. I've learned another thing, update your CV. And I kid you not, when I learned payroll, ha, I wanted to brag. I sharp, sharp, went back on my CV, dusted it, and I brought it there with pride that I have done this. So if you are looking to hire me now, and gladly give you because my CV is always like it is updated, so there's no point of me wasting time. I will just immediately send it to you, right? So please don't forget, network is basically you saying making friends with people, right? And one thing that you should know about upskilling yourself don't go and do something that is not in line with your industry. I've had to ask people, so what steps have you taken towards your personal development? And they tell me I'm learning UI UX and here you are applying for um, a customer service role. And I'm here confused like, well, UI UX, how does that help you? So please, whatever skill set you're doing, don't be a jack of all trades, master of none. Be specific, I'm into marketing. Marketing is so broad, right? So it's fine if you're still finding your feet and you're learning digital marketing, you're learning communications, branding and communications, 
you are learning content, it's fine. We understand because you've not found your, um, you've not found where you want to specialize. So yeah, we won't judge you about that. But don't go outside the box. You are learning something entirely different. In my head, I'm just like, that's just a wasted effort. It's like you um, trying to fill a, a tank with a basket. Really, it doesn't hold water, right? So I hope you've learned how to network now. Be intentional about it. I know how people are, you know how Nigeria is. People just even want to hear good things like, oh, you're doing a great job. But I can see the consistency. It's a good job and you know, keep it up and all of that. So now another big one, how to negotiate your salary. Now a lot of higher um, HR people will not teach you this. So thanks Printify for you know, inviting me so that I will give you this knowledge and you know thank you when it comes to salary right this is always where i have a problem i know companies don't want to pay and i have problem with um i have problems with job seekers not always settling for less like how do you have five years of experience and you are earning 90k or you're earning 150k net that is ridiculous. We're talking five years experience. You're already mid-level management, if you do not know. Five years, five years of my life. I've invested it slow and steady. And here I am, earning 150. It's ridiculous. And this, this problem is because people don't always talk. You know, they say something, close marks they close destiny. So you're looking for a job. Do not tell your friends. You not say even your mentor, some people don't even have mentors. You literally don't tell anybody. And then you go, oh, I have interviewed. And then you go, you kill it back to back to back. Salary comes and you're like, I'm sure the role has a budget. And I'm like, okay, my budget is 20K. What do you want to do about it? And they are laughing. <laughs> no, you know, this role, blah, blah, blah. Please, no. First thing first, it is you. You know how much effort you put in your career. Have this self-pride. Now, when I say self-pride, I'm not saying be outrageous or ridiculous, but know what you want, right? And I've listed out things you should consider here. The position. What position? I'm looking at graduate entry. Now, for people, for banks that recruit, you know, graduate trainee, some of them have the luxury to give you 250K. It's a bank, right? But you cannot come to a, an educational sector, that's the educational industry, to say, you that you just came out of school, you want to be earning 250,000. You're in the wrong industry because they can't afford that, right? Look at the position that you're looking out for. Oh, they say head of recruitment. That's a big one. You're a manager. They say customer experience lead. That's also a big one. You're a team lead. They say HR analyst. It's also a big one because come on, I'm starting from scratch in HR. So look at the position. Do it also affect, it determines the salary they're going to pay you. Now that's the position. I already know the position. They say they're looking for HR manager. All right, I have that on one side. Now I come back, my level of experience. Be true, to, you say to thyself, be true, right? Now ask yourself, how many years of experience do I have genuinely? Because sometimes we will write after years of experience, but in that three years, two and a half, they use it to play. They don't learn anything. So they literally just have six months. I have six months. Can I apply for this job? This is my six months. In this knowledge that I've gotten in these six months, can I use it on this job? to scale to this job, be true. It's like an evaluation that you're doing, right? You might look at the industry. I already explained that to you. Industry, you're looking at tech. Tech, they have money, it's tech. So yeah, they can afford to pay an entry level 250 k net, right? It's good. Educational industry, they don't have that luxury. They cannot pay you that. Some other industries cannot pay you that as well as an entry level person. So put the industry at the back of your mind. Now your skill set. 
Experience is different too. Your skill set. What can I do? I see I'm good at Excel. Rate myself over Excel. I'm a two over 10. This is telling me Excel, um, the candidate should be good at Excel. What level, what rating would they be expecting here? Are they looking at a six? With a six, excuse me, will a six fly? Will a five fly? So those are things you're looking at. Um, my other skill set, oh, this skill, will you fly here? This one, will you fly here? Truth be told, soft skills flies everywhere because every industry, every role, you know, we all need, the roles, they need soft skills. For now, we are looking at your hard skill, your technical skill. With this flyer, with this flyer, with this flyer, you put that aside. Before I come to benefit, I'll go to location. You look at it, I live in Paja. My, do you, this office is in Lekki, is in, let's say it's in Jakwande. How will I do this? Okay, you put that in mind. Deliverables, go back to the JD, all those things that you put there. Break it down one after the other. Try to create possible challenges that you're going to have on the go. And you're like, okay, you put that to another box. Your education and your certifications. You've done PHRI, you've done CIP, you've done PMP, you've done this, you've done product, you've done that, you've done, 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 done. Put it to one side. All these things that you've been doing, it's actually money that you're paying for them. Now your achievement, you look at it. Then this negotiating salary is after you have applied, after you've attended the interview, they're giving you an offer. Oh, dear Bolo Waterfair, we are pleased to, you know, welcome you to um, to be an integral part of our blah, 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 blah. Please find out the pay details below and then they write 600 net and then they'll go back, no, so, so you write 600 gross and then they'll go back and write the net is uh, 500, 500,000. And they'll tell you these are your benefits, blah, 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 blah. Now you look at it, you now go and open all these boxes and start to think that, ah, this one will not fly. I think this money is too small, right? I think it's too small. I need to negotiate. So you ask them, is this salary negotiable? You answer, you depending, you know, some recruiters will call you. So you call them like, ah, thank you for extending an offer to me. Don't forget, always be thankful. Always be thankful because you never know how many people were on the interview, you know, the whole list, how many people applied. But here you are, they give you an, an, an and they extend an offer to you. So always be thankful before you now say you want to negotiate. So these are things you should consider. Now, in a situation whereby the money can, that's the salary itself cannot be negotiated, there is something else you can negotiate, and that is your benefit package. See, I want you to understand that one of the things why I moved into HR was to be able to enlighten people when it comes to any money. When I started working, it wasn't like I had, you know, when I was in school, I said, ah, when I come out, after reading, burning midnight candle, I was like, ah, nah, nah. my first salary with 200K net, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. One thing, one thing. But guess what? My first salary was 65,000 naira. And that was in 2018. 20, yeah, that's my first salary. 65,000 naira in three months, they gave me 75,000 naira. And I was like, well, I knew that wasn't going to sustain me for a long time. I have side hustle, but you know, I knew that yo, you need to work on something, you need to do this, you need to do that and all that. So now, coming back, your benefit package. Then, before I expand on this, be specific about what you want. You know, if they give you 500 net, please, 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 please never negotiate your salary in gross. I beg you in the name of God, because I had one person come and I was like, oh, so how much do you want us to pay for this? One? And this is 500 gross. I'm like, okay, no problem. By the time we gave an offer to the person, the person that said, no, the money is too small. And my head, I'm like, you ask for 500 girls. We feel like, like 500 girls. We pay you 500 girls for your experience. And then you come back to say, no, the money was small. But it wasn't my fault because you negotiated in gross, right? So please always negotiate in net. That's your take home. That's the money that enters your bank account at the end of the month. So it's one of so that you'll be happy when you see that a lot or you'll be very frustrated when you see that a lot. So now, you can give them a range. 
can this be reviewed to 600 considering the fact that I have experience in the manufacturing industry, in the agricultural industry, in the this and the that, and I also have these um, certifications, blah, blah, blah. You know, you garnish it well. Let them see that your people, I bring value to the table. So yeah, please appreciate me better, right? Then they'll get back to you. Now, when they say, ah, that, no, I understand. We can see this, we can see that, you know, we understand you, but this is the salary. Then fine. If it's fine with you, negotiate your benefits. Ask them how many um, paid well, that's your working days leave you have. If they tell you 20, negotiate. You can tell them 30. Well, since you're not paying me what I want, I feel like a 30 days working leave would do for me. At least what I can make in cash, I can make in time. So you pay me. If I decide to go off one month, <clears throat> guess what? You want to pay me for it? Negotiate that. You can negotiate. Depending on your level, again, please first graduate. There are some things you cannot negotiate because you say you know. You can negotiate to have a company car. You can negotiate to have a company um, driver. If you're an expatriate, negotiate. They will even give you a study or rent on your behalf. Depending on the country you're from, they will get you a chef from your country to come, like, that will be cooking for you. So, yes, there are lots of things. Negotiate your transportation allowance, depending on, you know, how you how you how often you commute if you're like for example if you're a bd person and they tell you oh your transportation allowance for the month is 100k you can negotiate it like ah, 100k you explain to them why you need more money you can negotiate your atm and data allowance check people i know this one people consume a lot of data even social media people you consume a lot of data so when a client comes to you today that oh, i want you to manage my social media page i know how much Instagram alone consumes, not to talk of YouTube, not to talk of a lot. So please negotiate. Okay, so you pay me this money, but I also charge you the data allowance is 20K. I subscribe to Spectranet, blah, 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 based on your work. Explain to them, tech people, design people, that's graphics people, explain, negotiate these things with them, right? So that they can see it. Um, you can chill, let me try and get my thoughts back together. What else can you negotiate? Negotiate a lot of things to be very honest. Think of what, what do I want on this role, right? And negotiate it. Oh, so does the company do this down to launch? Right? I had a friend, I have a friend that turned on an offer. He's like, where well, I am now, they're giving me lunch on like every day. So I don't have to think of lunch. Like lunch is sorted. Good lunch, not just basic lunch. Good lunch is sorted. I'm coming to your side. If I, for each day I spend outside like my house, so for example, if he has to travel to Cape Town, for each day he gets hundred dollars. If I come to your coin, your your company now, your organization, do I have to travel? One, how much is my per day if I have to travel? How much is it? You tell me twenty five dollars. Here I am, any hundred dollars per day when I leave to come to end twenty five dollars. You so you now do one on one. How can I make for this twenty one dollars? Some people also look at the fact that as a BD person, I want to you know, travel, explore Africa. By all means, you can negotiate that as well. So look for what you want and negotiate with it. Now, when you have negotiated all these things and you've agreed, please tell them to put it back in the contract. They should write it in the contract and send it to you so you can sign. Reason being that when for example, if the HR manager leaves, a new one comes, and they just decided to just bring you one policy, one thing, one thing, one thing. You just show them your contract, like, yo, when you applied new, this, 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 was our agreement. So, right, let's just be quick that it does not affect anything, right? So, yes, those are things you can negotiate. HMO, as, as, um, as um, little as it is, HMO is a big deal. Because imagine if you fall sick, right? What do you do? You now go, hospital is, hospital bill is not cheap. Ordinary malaria drug is like 2K. How I many people make how much? So you spend malaria drug, 2K, it's just a lot. So negotiate your HMO. Negotiate your pension. Pension, there are some jobs that they don't pay pension for. Let's not be lying. You are doing five years. You don't have a pension account. If you, you don't have it, uh, please think, start thinking, negotiate because in the long run, you'll be old. You might not want to 
you may not have the strength to run around again. And the funny thing is, pension, if you're not working for like six months, you can ask them to be paying you money. So they'll be giving you a certain percentage because you know that, oh, I have money somewhere, right, that I can always use. So guys, please, these are the things that you can negotiate. Thank you. And it's time for questions. Do you have any questions for me? Let me see. Let me check the chat box. Any questions? Oh, this is so fast. Any questions for me? Any questions? Uh, is it just me? Okay. This so far. Sorry, if you have questions, you can unmute your mic while I go through the chat box and I will answer you. Thank you very much, Bolo Express. Does anyone have any question? If you have a question for Bolo, please, you could either unmute your mic and then speak. OK, good afternoon, Bolo Active and everybody. Hi. Um, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, it was a nice presentation. So um, my question is, um, recently, I just graduated. So um, I got a graduate training role and I was invited for the interview. So the, um, during the interview, I was asked that what range am I looking at for my salary? I was not like, okay, what do you get? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Salary expectation for the role, yeah. Yes. So um, actually, while filling the form, while filling the form, I was asked them to put my um, expectation, my salary range there. So I, um, I put 70, 80. But before filling the form, a friend of mine, I reached out to a friend of mine and she advised I searched the company online to know their capacity. Mm -hmm. And I also have a friend working in a similar company and it was like, okay, well, the range was within 70 to 90. So I placed it there. So um, back to the interview now, they're not asking me my salary expectation. And I told them that, them, sir, you have the prize as in, you have the amount you give to graduate trainees. Then I said, yes, that they,